Okay. How about now? Hi. Hi. Okay, hi. Um, thanks for waiting through the little um, changeover dance. Um, hi, my name is Maya Soren. Um, I, uh, my life mostly revolves actually around doing the sort of stuff that I'm going to be talking to you about and my day job uh, for a software consultancy is sort of what I do in my spare time these days. Um, what I do is essentially community building sort of at the intersection between um, open source software and other fields. A lot of science and research specifically is what I do, but I actually do all this stuff through a not-for-profit called the Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, it's got a very earnest um, mission statement, as you can see. Um, it's all about, you know, open data, open uh, knowledge, open wisdom, open informational exchange. It's been around in one form or another for about 10 years, started in the UK. In Australia, it's been around for about a couple of years. Um, and there's a bunch of different people that do various kinds of things with it. Um, uh, and it works around lots of, lots of different parts of Australia. Uh, I'm personally predominantly in Melbourne. Uh, and so most of what I'm, I'm going to be talking about is about that. But there's a whole heap of stuff that goes on everywhere. Um, it's a bit of a loose collective, really. Like, uh, we, we, we're getting incorporated and we've got a board and we've got an off-profit status just about ready to come off the press, which is going to finish the last couple of bits. But I kind of call us the department for messing around and doing cool stuff. Uh, we're one of those organisations that relies on a lot of, vol essentially on 100% volunteer effort. And because we've got a pretty free remit, we do a bunch of different kinds of things. Um, like saving the world by making the hipster map of Melbourne. Uh, you know, it was literally was like this completely frivolous idea. We have a few people around in Melbourne who really enjoy making maps and a few people who really hate hipsters. Um, so, you know, um, look, I've done research about radio frequency dosimetry that's got implications for world radio frequency safety standards and nobody cares about it like they do about the hipster map. This thing has had so much press. Um, yeah. yeah, apparently if you want to get famous, you want to hate on young people. Um, so because we deal with this intersection of different kinds of fields, we get all sorts of pushback about doing things in, you know, in the open way. And there's different complaints that people have and there's different ways that need, uh, like there's a lot of different kinds of communication that all of these fields need in order to get somewhere. Um, so Nick Gruen, he's the chair of the board. Uh, he's the person who started the Government 2.0 Task Force, if anyone's heard of that. No? Yep, okay. So government uh, decided a little while ago that they needed to uh, update the way that they do things like data and information, uh, as well as just community engagement. And uh, one of the things that came out of it was a bunch of people that actually got together and went, you know what, we can actually do this. And, and a lot of them had been doing it quietly behind the scenes in the way that you do things in government, which is uh, you ask for forgiveness, not permission. And I keep hearing that a lot. It's the only way to get things done, apparently. Oh, look, there's a lot of nodding heads. <laughs> right. Um, so a lot of the people who did that kind of thing uh, eventually uh, got together and formed a little working group, uh, which is now actually a pretty powerful working group, and they make a lot of policy changes. Um, as well as things like that, Nick uh, was sort of one of the people who got like GovHack started, and I'll be talking about that in a minute for anyone who hasn't heard of it, which I expect most of you have. Um, so the Omidya report is actually something that Nick did or almost on the side to his Government 2.0 thing, but it's a, it's a report that came out earlier this year about the impact of open data to uh, uh, federal economics. Uh, it's specifically about G20 countries, but uh, when you show uh, government people tables like that that says um, Australia uh, has, you know, saved or has gained things in the millions of dollars and in some cases billions of dollars, this is the economic impact, that tends to get people noticing things. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a thing with government. They really need to see the money. Um, even more than they need to see the money, they really need to see somebody else saying this is important. Like, a more, like the more important government department, 
uh, that comes out and says this is an important thing, the more likely they are to, to get on board is one of the things we've learned with, with doing all of this stuff. Um, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions, by the way. Um, so Fiona Tweedy organises GovHack in, Vic in Melbourne. Uh, there's a couple of different sites in Victoria. Uh, she also, uh, this is more or less how I'm going to run this. I'm just going to go through like the different people that are involved and what their impact is and what they're doing and what they've found is important in this area, sort of like, like, like at that edge. Um, so Fiona does a lot of government stuff. She used to work for the Privacy Commission. Uh, she used to work for the Australian Charities uh, uh, Regulator. Uh, she also does digital humanities, so she's a, a Roman historian, and now she works at University of Melbourne as sort of a community builder. Turns out there are jobs like that. There really are jobs that do, you know, sort of what we all, you know, what I do in my spare time. It's kind of awesome, allegedly spare time. Um, so Fiona got involved with organising GovHack. Who here has been or involved with or knows how GovHack, right? Yeah, a few people. So it's a national competition that started a few years ago. Um, after the Australian government got on board with the sort of world trend of opening up information and data sets and making them publicly available, um, someone went, hey, let's hold this competition to see what we can do with all these different data sets. Uh, and nowadays there's like literally millions of data sets that come across every like, like area of government you can think of from uh, federal through to local, through to all these different areas. And uh, this, you know, a few years ago, it was a few people in a room. And this year, there were $300,000 government sponsorship and $100,000 in, um, in prize money uh, across the country. And it's like this huge thing. And it's sort of going through with uh, one of the ways that all of this open movement is changing government is getting them to create policies about how to do it better and how to do it well. Uh, you know what it's like with government. The moment anything happens, you have to have a policy about it. Um, so there's now policies in most states about how to open up data and what's best practice. And the fact that you have to do it by default, unless you can show that there's a reason not to, for example, for privacy uh, or for some kind of economic reason, uh, that, that's you know beyond it takes us a little too long to make a spreadsheet which is actually like, like the real reason why people don't open up data sets. Um, you know, if you've ever collected data, you know what it's like. You, behind the scenes, you kind of take all these shortcuts and, and your stuff looks a little bit like it's put together with paddle pop sticks and rubber bands until you've got to clean it up to show it to someone else. And that, that's when it gets really neat. That, that's really the main reason why um, it's hard to get data sets from people, especially government, especially researchers. Um, but we, actually, we found that it's not as hard as people think, uh, and we often give them a bit of a hand, uh, teach people how to make APIs, or, uh, or actually, you know, sit down and say, you know what, just give us what you have, anything is better than nothing. And that makes a big difference. We found that a lot more data enters the public domain like that. Um, I'm just going to go through a couple of the things that have come out of this year's GovHack. There's some amazing entries. Um, these aren't even my favourites. These are just two that I randomly picked out. Um, so this was a small team in Melbourne that took uh, federal and state and volunteer gathered uh, data about water quality and mashed it up with um, build, building permit information about which buildings get torn down. So you get all this really, informa really interesting information about how uh, the water quality changes with policy decisions made by like building regulators. Um, these people created an automatic infographic generator, which is actually an extension of an entry from last year where um, the main issue people have is, you know, I've got this crappy spreadsheet. What do I do with it now? How do I show it to people? So here we go. Upload your CSV. It pulls out this gorgeous infographic. And they've got just a bunch of examples on their site, which you can go and have a look. Like this one, which is Heroes of the Great War Chronicle newspapers of 1915 to 1919, which are kind of cool. And there's like this set of um, uh, charts that it gives you. Um, it's really cool. Um, oh, 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 there was one, one more point I wanted to say. Um, in terms of dealing with government, and actually we can go to the next slide. Um, so in Western Australia, uh, they've got this issue where they don't have uh, 
like privacy data frameworks or, or the government doesn't have a chief information officer yet. Um, what they found works in order to get governments to open up data and to get involved in these kinds of things and specifically to open up data and get involved in things like GovHack where they're supporting people doing things with it. Um, so one thing is to actually show them the results. Uh, we've started holding like showcases to government uh, stakeholders, especially like uh, data custodians and, and higher ups and saying, so there was this competition on the weekend. You probably didn't hear of it, even though there were like several thousand people involved across the country. Here's what they did. Here's what they did with your data specifically. Uh, and th that got a lot of response. And what we found is that like people right down the bottom end, the people who gather the data, the data custodians, they're well on board. Uh, and people right at the top of the uh, government department food chain, they love this. They're well into it. They'll throw money your way if you ask them correctly. The people in the middle are, are the hardest to, to deal with. You know, the people who are really risk averse and they've got, um, you know, I'm not really sure if I'm allowed to make this decision. I'm not sure how much I can reveal. I, I have to go through seven layers of hierarchy to get the actual boss's approval. Um, can take up, to, if you're ever doing this, it, just remember it can take you up to 18 months to get a really simple data set. Um, what does work, and this is really interesting, is that it's much easier for governments to do procurement than it is to do sponsorship. So, if you frame this as, if you give us this actual large wad of cash, you'll get a result at the end of it. That works a lot better. Um, but the flip side of it is you have to sit down with the government people and say, no, actually, you can't send us a project manager for the weekend to tell us what to do with your data. No, that won't work. No, really. I can't promise you what you'll get at the end. You will get something and it'll be pretty awesome, but I can't tell you now what it'll be. And that can be an interesting conversation to have. But, um, you know, $300,000, nothing to sneeze at. Um, yeah, what they found in WA, uh, because they don't have like the top level of government mandating any of this stuff, uh, as soon as they got the Department of Premier and Cabinet on board to say, no, this is actually economically viable and you should definitely do it and it's good for your um, users and it's good for your user involvement and it's good for your community outreach, suddenly things changed a bit. So, you know, mum says so, so it's a good thing to do. I never said that. Um, Okay, moving on from government a bit, uh, a little bit. So Steve is uh, just a huge mapping fanboy and he makes all these maps. He was actually sort of the, the person who did a lot of the back end work for the hipster map. Um, he runs a whole heap of these, you know, like when I said that we're sort of the department for doing stuff and messing about, um, we literally, somebody will have an idea and will go, I want to own a hackathon, great, put it on the meetup. Seven people show up and like, uh, you know, a week later you've got a thing. So transport camp uh, and what Steve started doing is getting a lot of the local government departments on board with, um, if you give us your data, we'll get you the people to make things happen for you. Like all the stuff that you want to do with your data, all the stuff that you know is possible, we'll just do it in the quiet for you. And it's, it's working really well, actually. Um, and he's now got a position as like a, a data guru um, where his job is actually, as a consultant, going around to various um, institute, like uh, academic institutes and government departments and saying, so, you've got this problem. Tell me about it. Let me fix it for you. And, uh, like, it's, it's really doing a lot of good things. Um, okay, moving into science. So, um, Matt Todd, uh, who's over at the University of Sydney, um, he's sort of peripherally involved with the Open Knowledge Foundation, has been on and off since it started. Um, so he started the Open Source Malaria Project, uh, which is actually what it sounds like. They do malaria vaccine research and they make all of their research completely accessible and open. They hold their logbooks online. Uh, they have all their meetings online. Anyone can join in. Uh, what's really interesting is that uh, you know, how do you get academic brownie points for it? For it? Uh, who here is, uh, has been or is in academia? Couple of, your wife is, right. Sorry, no. <laughs> yes, I'm sure you know. Okay, so um, the thing with academia is that 
even though allegedly, you know, you're, as an academic, you're judged on uh, the work you do as an educator, really what you're judged on in terms of career prospects and career security is your publications. Yep, yes, more nodding heads, yes. Nobody is disputing that. So there's a whole movement away from that. Um, it's one of those systems that favours the people who've been around the longest. You've been around for a while, everybody knows you, you're probably an adult Caucasian male, let's face it. Um, yes, a few more nods. Um, so you're known, you've published. Once you've published, once you've got a few grants, people already know you, you keep getting your grants. There's actually no um, restriction on academics to retire anymore, so you get like 85 year old blokes still around, sucking up all the grant money. Um, and most of the publications, actually, that's how it works. Um, so there's this whole move away from that now uh, into, you know, there's conversations that have been happening around the research world for a while about, okay, so what's Git for science? Um, how do we actually do appropriate version control of data? How do we share it appropriately in the back end? How do we give microcredits? Like rather than spending like three years, five people, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment, we've got a result with seven that we can't publish because they're negative results. One result will publish, it takes us a year and a half to get through the publication process with a peer review. You know, five years later, you've got something out. That's a long time. Like, most grants are three years. It, it, and, and positions don't actually last that long, usually. Like, a research position doesn't last like, as long as some publications do to make happen. So there's this big move into, well, um, how do we give micro-attributions to uh, researchers? So there's things like, um, like the equivalent of a, like a Git username, for example, where you can have all of your attributions to a project uh, that are linked to your ID, ORCID, O-R-C-I-D, um, you might have heard of it. It's kind of cool. Uh, you can go and, uh, in the same way that you've got like a, a DOI, like a, a library number essentially for every published paper, uh, you've got a, an online ID uh, for who you are and all of your contributions to publications, especially if they're open, especially if you can do pre-publication review. So there's a lot of open publication, pre-publication models happening now. It's, it's a bit of a thing around science where the, like there's a few issues because it's a very, very old model. Uh, the, uh, d does everybody know what I'm talking about when I mention the word LCV? Yeah, yeah, a few people are nodding. Yeah, so hi. Well, yeah. That's where academics really need to wake up. They're the problem with it, the attitude they've got with getting themselves published, giving up their copyright so right. and hanging around for that a length of time to get that level of recognition. Yep. And yep. Uh, having that uh, when it is finally published. That's yeah. absolutely. Yep. Yep, exactly right. So there's uh, the, the, the publication model is um, I give up my IP for free after doing all these years of research to a company that makes my paper available behind a very expensive paywall. So it's not only uh, like a pay problem and a redundancy problem, but it's also uh, an equal rights access problem. Um, so, open source malaria, getting around all of that. Uh, you want to go find out what they're doing, you go to their website, you go dial in on their lab meetings, you ask them what they're doing, you join their Twitter stream, you want to know, get involved. If you've got ideas, get involved. They, they, they may or may not answer because, you know, a lot of people have the same kind of ideas about how to make research projects work. Uh, but they do things like uh, give other academics kudos by getting them to come on board as a special advisor, for example. But it's all open, it's all completely publicly available, all of this information is before publication, which is really new, really interesting. Um, and it's now moved to become the Open Source Pharmaceutical Project, uh, which is a, a separate thing. Um, some of the work that goes behind that is actually uh, closed, so like you won't see the results until after, the, like only as a published paper, you can't get access to the raw data. Um, but some of it isn't, and the idea is to uh, use all these open source models to create pharmaceuticals, especially for pandemics that affect the world. So 
things like malaria, like dengue, things that affect more than just white people. Um, okay, Alex Holcomb. Now, he's done something cool. He's also um, involved with the Open Knowledge Foundation. Sorry, was that five minutes? Cool. Um, how many more slides have I got? A few. Cool. Um, so what they've done is uh, created uh, a whole stream of publication around negative results. Uh, not just negative results, but actually replications. So they get a whole heap of academics to pull, like to, to choose, a, actually, a, so far, a fairly non-controversial paper and say, let's all replicate it. So they get up to 30 labs involved replicating the same uh, study. Uh, they share all their results. Everything's pretty open. It, it's a bit behind the scenes until it's ready to go out. But uh, like that, that's really interesting. That, that's a really new model. Um, and so now they've got scientists on board with the idea of making data and information open and available. Um, oh, this is a thing that I ran. Uh, I started a, a hackathon in Melbourne, and this year it was Melbourne and Sydney, and I think next year it's going to be like in five different cities. Uh, basically, I get a bunch of medical researchers and say, what is a problem that we can solve for you over a weekend? And it's amazing, like the sort of stuff that comes out of it. Um, I'll come back to it because uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to talk about briefly. So Anne-Marie Elias, she works at FACS, uh, one of the, uh, well, one of the departments around uh, New South Wales. And she discovered, she, she actually started this whole project around giving, getting different levels of government talking to each other and sharing data around who is actually needing of help because you can't necessarily know until you look at all the data that you've got really high incidences of domestic violence in North Shore of Sydney, for example. Um, but when you share it, that's what you find out. And then she discovered that, like, so she started this whole project about it, and it's all, again, ask forgiveness, not permission, government model. Um, and she, you know, some private sector friend told her about GovHack and she's like, oh my God, there's this whole parallel universe. Why didn't I know about it? So now she's got a bunch of uh, really good developers involved with the project and they're making uh, f uh, back ends for them that, that work really well. Uh, it's really cool. Um, so Maggie is the person who won Health Hack in Melbourne this year. Um, they didn't do anything great in terms of the technical stuff. Uh, Margaret uh, Gully Evans, she started the Australian Academy of Sciences Early and Mid-Career Researchers Forum. And so she spent months trawling through NHMRC data about uh, who has and hasn't received grants. And over the weekend, they created, you know, just a data visualization. Of, and, and you can go through and, and have a look at it and um, break the data down by institution, by state, by grant type. Turns out, oh, look, um, senior male academics get most of the grant money, who knew? Um, Charles Galea, they're a power couple, um, his group created uh, basically, like there's this little hole where you've got on one end uh, the field of genomics that go, okay, there's all these proteins, they have all these point mutations, this protein is associated with a disease, but we don't know which mutation causes it, there could be up to 20, here's a list, and over here uh, the bench scientists go, protein's very good, I don't know which one of them causes the disease, I'm just going to run through months of really expensive experiments to figure out which is the most, you know, which, which mutation is responsible. Charles is a structural biologist, he has this power of looking at a protein and going, this is the mutation that's likely to cause your problem. But he, like, it takes him forever because there's all this uploading and downloading and configuring web apps. So his group created a tool that does all of that automatically in the background. And he just goes, OK, this is the protein. Here is my list. I can tell you by looking at it, you should start investigating this, this, and this. So saving a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of postdocs coming into the lab on the weekends. Um, so uh, tools that have come out of this whole software, not software, ends of things. These are just three that I'm going to ma mention. So Sage Math Cloud, and, and there's a bunch of cloud services uh, like, Open uh, like Open Tech Stack, uh, which is uh, what the Nectar Cloud runs on. Uh, runs. So there's a bunch of um, software packages for researchers, mostly for data analysis. REDCap is really cool. It's actually uh, much more useful for things like digital humanities. It's a university uh, 
not just, but it's predominantly used in universities for uh, storing and managing research data. What the, the real advantage of it is uh, if I am a researcher and I've got research data and I'm an archaeologist or a historian or something uh, and I go up to central services and say I've got all this data that I need stored and cleaned and stuff, they say that's great. Let's sit down and go through this checklist of what your data will be structured like, which blows their minds like they've never even thought about it. Um, oh, Authoria, um, like Google Docs, but for writing academic papers. It's awesome. If you haven't found it, you should. Um, that's a really old screenshot of a paper we're writing about Health Hack. Um, in Brisbane, there's a group that does, uh, so again, Department of Messing Around. Um, the, the two people in Brisbane who kind of run open knowledge stuff are Anna and Anna. Um, they're awesome. Uh, and they mostly, do, so they did like a debate about privacy versus anonymity and, and you know, l l like where is data privacy actually interfering with good f useful things in the world and, and uh, all those kinds of things. Uh, they hold a lot of like, like open drinks, we've started doing those in different places around the country. You do something open, come and have a drink and meet everyone else who does hardware, software, research, food. The Open Food Network is amazing. You should go and discover them. I probably don't have time to talk about them. Um, I wanted to do just last couple of slides about um, what it is that we come up against when we talk to all these different people. So mostly when you say, I'm running a hackathon, people look at you and go, what? Um, God, I really wish I could go back in time and remove that name because I keep hearing the, are you WikiLeaks? meme now. Um, don't use that word if you're wanting to get people outside of software involved in things. Um, you, you, you've really got to spend a lot of time explaining, you know, why would anybody do things in an open sourced way and that's okay. That's actually really valuable to explain why you would do it in science, why you would do it in government. Um, there's a lot of the, if I do, you know, if I offer my services, then I'm devaluing them. Uh, I heard that argument really recently from a bioinformatician uh, around health hack. Um, you know, and the response is, of course, researchers don't understand uh, the value that software can add to their lives. The whole point of this is to create a career stream for bioinformaticians. Um, yeah, I'll share my data after publication. That's a really common model. Uh, and it's actually, you can get people on board by saying you make your git commits with your ID and it's obvious who started this and it's okay. You don't, you know, you can share your data after publication, that's okay too, but you can also uh, make it visible who started this project and who did what. Um, yeah, so government, you've got to explain to them about procure. This is just a quick summary. Uh, yeah, this is what they're all worried about. If you're ever approaching people in these fields about why they want to get involved and how to make it easier for them. These are the things you've got to address. Yep. Um, if you want to contact me, I am available on either of those uh, Twitter handles and or I'm eminently Googleable. Thank you. <laughs>